I gotta tell you something. I've decided that I'm not gonna go on vacation anymore. I'm not gonna go to cons. I'm not gonna go to TwitchCon. I'm not gonna go to DEF CON. Every time I do, there is a major vulnerability that comes out. When CrowdStrike came out, I was on vacation in New Jersey. And when this bug came out, I was at TwitchCon. I was sitting there with John Hammond. I was eating a burrito. We're talking about how cool computers are. And my buddy sends me a text and uh, critical exploit in the MediaTek Wi-Fi chipset CVE 2024 remote RCE for any device that uses the software development kit, the SDK of these two chips. In this video, I wanna kinda of go through what that means, how it affects the environment of wireless devices, and we'll go into what the exploit actually does and how you can mitigate it yourself. Now, if you're new here, hi, this is low level, I rebranded, low level learning is too hard to say, a channel where I talk about cybersecurity and software security, so if you like that or just wanna hang out, hit that sub button, I really appreciate it. Yeah, this is a pretty interesting bug. Basically, what happened was someone found a vulnerability in WAPD, no, it's, it's not that WAP, um, it's wireless access point, I think, uh, provisioning daemon, but basically this company called MediaTek, what they do is they make the chips that a lot of wireless routers use, right? So the wireless router chip is one that's going to run the OS internally, but also it has to handle all of the Wi-Fi RF, like packet ingestion, right? And so to make the life of the providers that are going to use these chips, like Netgear or Ubiquiti, for example, as mentioned in the article, to make their lives easier, they provide an SDK, a software development kit. And typically that software development kit comes with two things, like one, like the data sheet that tells you, you know, where the addresses in the chip do certain things, uh, but also some pre-built code, WAPD being one of them, where you can just use that piece of code to provision the wireless access point itself. Now, just like anything, right, WAPD is code, code can have vulnerabilities, and the guy that wrote this blog post here found a buffer overflow, shocking, in, in that code. Now, yes, I know, it is 2024 and we are still writing code uh, where we copy too much memory into another buffer. Buffer overflow being the, the nature of the bug that we're talking about here. You'll see here on the very bottom line, all that happens is they receive data from the network and they cast that packet buffer, the p packet buff, to this structure. And then they pull the length out of that structure and then use that as the end value for a mem copy, effectively giving the user or the you know attacker uh, control of this memory move that allows them to do the buffer overflow. Now, there is a much more in-depth write-up that I'm not going to go into in this video by the actual person that discovered the bug. The write-up goes over them uh, compiling WAPD for different platforms and increasing the security of it in each in each exploit. And eventually it ends with them doing a uh, exploit on the, the Netgear WAX 206, which is a wireless access point that does Wi-Fi 6. Now, the reason that I found this bug so interesting is that from like a bug class standpoint, it's a bug that exists at a level that is below manufacturer code, right? So typically people kind of like place trust in brands. Like for example, I don't trust Netgear. I do trust Ubiquiti. Again, that's not me like shitting on Netgear or anything. I've used the routers for a long time up until there was like a vulnerability that came out circa like I think 2019, 2020, where every Netgear router had this buffer overflow in like the web page. So I took that as a choice to, to move off of Netgear, and so I use a different brand now. But you'll notice that there are multiple platforms that are affected by this vulnerability. Now, the reason being that the vulnerability exists not in the OS written by Ubiquity or the OS written by Netgear, but the code provided by the SOC or the system on a chip manufacturer. So because of that, it makes the bug more pervasive and it could exist not only in you know manufacturer developed devices, but also it affects Net, uh, OpenWRT 19 and 21, which as if you're not aware, OpenWRT is a router OS that is meant to be open source. And if you get a device from a company like Netgear, for example, where you don't necessarily trust the code on the device, you can flash OpenWRT onto the device and replace all the code so you know exactly what the code is doing. Now this obviously implies you've read the code and you know not everyone reads the code, but at least it's you know it's being more openly uh, monitored than the Netgear code, for example. Now I do wanna give my props or my respect or whatever you wanna call it to Netgear. So at the end of the article that is actually that SonicWall sources to make this article, um, this is the blog post by the person that found this bug and it shows them exploiting it in three different categories that they compiled themselves. And then exploit four is them actually attacking a WAX 206, which is a router by Netgear. Now what's really, really cool is not only is this a device that is on a modern chipset, it's using ARM architecture 64, which is actually really, really rare for routing devices. Ones that I've looked at typically are like old ARM or even MIPS. Um, it's on an ARC 64 device, but also they do full RELRO, ASLR, NX, 
and stack canaries. So if you're not familiar with the embedded world, one of the biggest issues that I've had with embedded devices in the past is that basically none of these mitigations are on and therefore when you get a buffer overflow, it's just the wild west. Like you get to do whatever you want. By having all these mitigations on, it makes it much more difficult to use a buffer overflow to do something meaningful. Now obviously they were able to exploit the device. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but they were able to get a final exploit where they can arbitrarily run system commands. And actually in building this exploit, they also found a bug in the kernel, which is kind of crazy, but that's, again, go read their article. I did not write this, I did not find this. I want you to give them all the credit. And if you don't know what these mitigations are, I'll walk through them. They're all pretty straightforward, but it's I think it's good for people that write code that you know, even if you're not an offensive security researcher, um, to know what the mitigations that your compiler offers to you, so you make sure that you're actually using all the security features that you can use, right? Because if these things weren't here, this bug would be much easier to exploit. Obviously, they got code execution, so they're able to exploit it fully, um, but it, it was definitely a lot more work uh, than otherwise. So full rel row, uh, this basically means that the relocatables are read only. So in the ELF format, the executable linkable format, which is the format for uh, executables in Linux, there's a structure called the global offset table. The global offset table is used for when, for example, you have a function called printf, right? You don't write printf, you just use it. When you run your code, the linker goes in and it populates to the global offset table with addresses of those functions, right? So full rel row basically means that that table is not writable, so a arbitrary write vulnerability couldn't overwrite those functions and point to hacker code. Um, ASLR is a pretty straightforward one that's address-based layout randomization. Um, in, in code, when people are trying to hack it, when they wanna run to code that they control, they wanna return to code that the program has, if they don't know where that code is, it makes it much harder to do, right? You need to leverage some kind of leak to bypass ASLR. So uh, by randomizing the address space of the memory map, then it's much harder to exploit the, the program. NX is non-executable. Basically, it just means that the stack memory, the memory that you put your user data onto, is not executable. It'd actually be shocked how rare that is in the embedded world. Like, I don't know why. And then stack and areas. Stack and areas are when you put a magical nonce value or a random value that only the kernel knows and the program knows on the bottom of every stack frames. So when you do a buffer overflow, by clobbering that canary, before the return happens, the the program checks to see if that canary is the same value, and then from there, if it's clobbered, it'll kill the program. But the fact that all of these are actually enabled is really, really impressive to me. I've been doing research on embedded devices for a long time, um, and this is the first time that I've seen a router by you know a, a traditional manufacturer uh, enable all these mitigations. That being said, despite that, they were able to still use an arbitrary write via that buffer overflow to get control of the program, despite these mitigations, so it does go to show that even though your com your compiler offers all of these, it may not necessarily mean that you are, you are completely safe, right? So still you have to write safe code, you have to check your end values and compare them against the destination buffer size, um, but that being said, you know, it's pretty interesting. Now the question is, would Rust have caught this bug, right? Would Rust have allowed you to do this? The answer is potentially, right? So Rust would maybe have allowed you to get to this place where you're able to move an end value into a buffer that is smaller than that value, right? But the thing is, the Rust programming language does runtime copy checks. So you would copy into the array and it would begin to overflow it. And the minute you left that array's bounds, you would kill the program. So it would effectively turn this bug into a DOS or a denial of service and remove the ability for a hacker to get control of the control flow. Now, that being said, still not great, not a great place to be. We probably would prefer that our code didn't have, you know, didn't have DOS conditions. Um, but that being said, I think it's still, it is safer than, than the alternative, which is hackers getting control of our code. I know we all don't like Rust a ton. Uh, I think it has a weird, People get really political with the Rust for some reason, but I think in terms of writing safe code, it is easier to write safe code in Rust and harder to write safe code in C, just personal opinion. That being said, I still think you should learn C and know how computers work at a fundamental level, which brings in our sponsor, me. This is the Level Academy, my course website. I truly believe that you can't write efficient, effective code if you don't know how a computer works at a fundamental level. And the way that you learn how computers work at that level is by learning low level languages. My website here will teach you all of that in a series of courses that you get access to with one time payment. So in this course here, we'll teach you C, we'll go through all the basics of how to get your compiler set up, how to make arrays and loops. And then from there, we'll go into a course project where we build our own employee database. If you don't wanna learn that, you wanna learn assembly, that's also included. We'll go from the top to bottom to learn all the assembly instructions, and then we'll build our own simple shell 
in assembly. You can't write good code if you don't know how computers work and where do you learn how computers work? At Low Level Academy. We'll see you there. Back to the video. Anyway guys, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Go show uh, Coffin Sex blog some love. Go hit them up on socials. Go check out their GitHub. Throw them some stars. And in the meantime, go check out this other video that I think you'll enjoy just as much. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it.